No, sorry, we gotta work. Everything's set and ready to go. Yes. Go ahead and put this on Welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us this afternoon and delaying the start of your spring break. It appears as you walk across the campus that a number of our students have gotten an early start on their break. Delighted to welcome you here. I'm Jim Goldgeier, Dean of the School, and uh, very delighted to have Maria Otero here for our Dean's discussion. Uh, it's a great time to have her here, given uh, the issues that she's worked on and giving all the, given all the things that are in the news, uh, in particular uh, events in Syria and Ukraine, but uh, there's plenty of other things that we can talk about. Maria was uh, in the first Obama term. The Hillary Clinton State Department was Under Secretary of State for Civilian Security, Democracy, and Human Rights, and in that position oversaw uh, U.S. policy on, the, uh, on a global spectrum of, of civilian security issues, including population, refugees, human trafficking, narcotics, global criminal justice, and countering violent extremism. Uh, and she also served as the president's special representative for Tibetan issues. 
she was formerly president and chief executive officer of Axion International, which is a leader in microfinance and economic development. Uh, and prior to Axion, uh, where she worked for 23 years, she was an economist for Latin America at the Women in Development Office of the U.S. Agency for International Development, also served at the Center for Development and Population Activities, and was an adjunct professor elsewhere in Washington, D.C. before joining <laughs> the State Department. Um, so uh, it's great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. It's a She's great an old friend of SIS, so it's really wonderful to have her here uh, with us at SIS. Uh, I want to start by um, talking about the your position at the State Department. Uh, this is uh, uh, this undersecretary position has been named a number of things mm -hmm. over the last 20 years, indicating the kind of priorities that the mm -hmm. particular administration would have. Um, using a term like civilian security uh, is a very non-traditional mm -hmm. term. What was the goal in naming the position as it was in having uh, a, a uh, an office that had been an office on reconstruction uh, and stabilization become a bureau? And how did that fit in with the larger goals of Secretary Clinton in trying to reshape American diplomacy and development uh, after a period in which most of the emphasis in U.S. foreign policy was on military action? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, to try to put it in, uh, in, in a summarized form, and, and let me start by saying that serving as undersecretary um, and working for Hillary Clinton were two of the highest honors of my life. It was really wonderful to represent this country. At the time that Secretary Clinton came in, the Obama administration came in, clearly we had been using um, a military response to address uh, the issues that we were encountering in the world, certainly the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan. And I think Secretary Clinton, um, while emphasizing the importance of the role of global leadership that the United States should play, uh, found it very important that we really rebalance the way in which we address our foreign policy and our, our foreign affairs, and that we make greater use of, di of diplomacy and also of development, so the, this idea of the three Ds, mm -hmm. where one had just really taken over. Um, and the, the idea was that um, in rebalancing these, you really would turn more towards um, a foreign policy that was led more by civilians. And so that effort was, was what was really behind uh, the process that Secretary Clinton put in place, which is called the QDDR, which basically means a strategic plan. What is the Department of State going to do in the next four years? And the argument that she was making there was that diplomacy um, allowed you to address regional issues and global issues, not just country to country, state to state. Uh, it also allowed you to really move forward the values and the principles on which this country is based, all those that are associated with uh, democracy, which in the past had really been almost seen uh, related to the, to the rifle, if you will, as we were trying to almost impose uh, that to other countries. And we also saw this as a way to address conflict and to help countries become more stable and more, um, uh, more able to, uh, to reach uh, greater security for their own people. So these were the concepts that led to this strategic plan, in, uh, or the QDDR. And it was all in the context also of how the world was reshaping in the mm -hmm. 21st century. So you know we had new countries that were com coming up that were really developing the, um, the desire not just to develop their middle class, but also to become players international, Brazil, India, uh, China, of course. Um, you had uh, a situation in which you also had non-state actors actively involved in helping shape the direction of, uh, of events. And some of those non-state actors were corporations, civil, uh, civil society, NGOs, other players that really have become very influential players. So how do you deal with them within the context of foreign uh, policy? 
And there were also other uh, non-state actors, uh, whether it was organized crime or um, terrorist groups, extreme groups, others who were deadly and who provided really threats that, uh, that crossed borders. And you were also more aware of some of the issues that the world faced that really transcended national borders as well, whether it was climate change, uh, whether it was uh, issues related to disasters uh, or terrorism itself. So you know, all of these things became part of the context, <clears throat> the way in which technology had evolved with uh, technology enabling people, individuals, to affect the course of events. And we certainly saw that much later in the Arab Spring, uh, but also with the problems of cybersecurity. So, you know, I think when the Obama administration came in, uh, we really looked at how different the world was and how much we needed to make use and create tools in, um, in diplomacy that we really hadn't used. And so one of those was the one that was related primarily to my area of work because uh, part of what uh, Secretary Clinton believed was so important in the diplomacy was to find ways in which we as the U.S., with the leadership we provide, could help countries protect their own people, um, could help countries make greater use of the rule of law, become, develop more stable societies, uh, develop more just societies. So this concept of security, of countries developing increased security to their own people, became even more important because so many countries were in situations of conflict. Um, you know, I think at any point in time, you have about 50 countries mm -hmm. around the world mm. where some kind of internal or other issues coming up. So with all of this, she decided to take those pieces of the Department of State that in one way or another could contribute to or, or could enable us to contribute to developing, helping develop security in other countries, and she brought them all together. And one of the things that's very interesting about how she did that is that she took hard, what are called hard security issues, um, issues related to terrorism, to organized crime, um, to um, topics that relate directly to, to those kinds of uh, concerns, um, and she put them in the same place as she put the soft security issues, which have to do with humanitarian relief and assistance that have to do with human rights and assisting in helping the freedoms of peoples be maintained. So all of a sudden you had a spectrum within the Department of State of um, everything from addressing extremism and terrorism all the way to providing help to refugees and displaced people. Um, those bureaus within the Department of State had never really talked to each other. Mm -hmm. You know, they never saw that they were part of a continuum that could help us pursue this. When she brought them all together and then she asked me to head this up, uh, there were five big bureaus and three offices, including trafficking in persons, mm -hmm. um, the office that had to do with um, um, with genocide, with atrocities, um, and it was called um, War Crimes Office. Mm -hmm. But when you come from the office called War Crimes, nobody lets you in their country, you know, so we had to change the name to Global Justice or something of that sort. And, um, and when you put them all together, you had about $5 billion mm -hmm. of resources uh, that could be made available to other institutions or to NGOs, or enable us to partner with others in doing this work. So um, my effort was to be able to integrate all of these topics into the way in which we interacted with the countries uh, and with the situation. So clearly, none of this was easy. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, we've seen many cases, and we continue to see them, where um, the use of diplomacy has really not yielded what we wanted it to. Uh, Syria, I would say, is the worst or the most intractable and difficult mm -hmm. case where we really weren't able to, where we haven't been able to really resolve this uh, situation. We can certainly talk about that some more. But anyway, that's, mm -hmm. those are some of the major areas. And the only one that, the only additional one that I would um, put in there was that, um, 
Secretary Clinton believed that it was very important, and this is certainly something that changed a little bit the way the department worked, to incorporate into the way we did diplomacy uh, our, own our own efforts to represent and to speak for the very vulnerable populations in different countries. Mm -hmm. And vulnerable mm -hmm. meant primarily women. Right. And so she made the arguments related to women. Again, we can talk a little bit more about women because in my context, I had to address the issue of women, peace, and security, not, not women's economic empowerment uh, or women's uh, equity issues, but really the role mm -hmm. they could play in that. Uh, LGBTs, mm -hmm. uh, groups, um, um, persons with disabilities. In other words, those vulnerable groups that really needed to be able to exercise their full range of freedoms. Um, and so all of that changed the department a great deal. None, none of this had been done before. And you mentioned how many conflicts there are at any one time in the world. And some of them, when, you know, when, we, when we look at the media, we see a lot of attention paid to them. We see a lot of attention paid to Syria. We see a lot of attention recently, of course, paid to Ukraine. Others, at least with respect to the media, it's more episodic, whether it's Sudan or Central African Republic, Congo, which has been going on for a long time. How does, how do folks in an office like yours, in, in the State Department, White House, thinking about these issues, lay out the priorities for where to get involved, where not to get involved, how deeply to get involved, when to take the lead on getting involved, when to try to get others, whether it's the Europeans or whether, you know, in the case of African conflicts, whether it's, whether it's African countries uh, that, can, mm -hmm. that can try to do more uh, to help situations in their own neighborhood. Uh, you know, how do you, how do you manage that, that, that full set? There's a whole set of elements that go into that equation and into trying to, um, to figure this out because you're absolutely right. Um, today we're looking at Ukraine as the crisis of the moment, but all those other crises that exist are still there, mm -hmm. and you're still trying to address them. You're still trying to play a role as the U.S. As the US in addressing them. So there were a couple of factors that I certainly used as I did this work. One was clearly in the Department of State, the regional bureaus are the bureaus that have the direct state-to-state -state relationship that really formulate the policy, move it forward, um, prioritize on the issues that one can address. Um, in my case, I would do two things. One is work directly with those bureaus to find, to determine which countries were the ones in which the areas that I worked in could make the greatest difference and where we could be able to, um, um, to somehow bring some, some mm -hmm. change about. So, um, and it is uh, very interesting that with, that with those kinds of criteria, I spent very little time in Europe. I spent most of my time in, uh, in Africa, um, some time in Latin America, and uh, in some places in, uh, um, in Asia, Bangladesh, uh, topics related to Burma, Myanmar, and, um, and some other. But when you, so that was one of the ways in which we determined what we could do. Um, the additional thing was then you had to really prioritize because um, we are talking about a time of very scarce resources. Um, so if you add to all of this how it is that the U.S. can move this forward, the defense budget uh, compared to the budget of the State Department is, you know, you can't even compare them. There's many right. zeros that right. are present in one and not in the other. Right. So being able to carry all this out then meant also that you had to find different ways of uh, interacting. You could form partnerships with other countries and uh, Depending on the issue, there were countries in Europe that were very intent. France, certainly in Francophone Africa, uh, would play an important role. Uh, Norway was particularly interested in uh, countries like Indonesia or some mm -hmm. other countries so that you could really work closely together um, in a way that you could then leverage each other. Um, 
you could also bring in, interestingly, the private sector mm -hmm. in a way that uh, the Department of State had not done. So you could engage um, multinational corporations. You could engage um, companies that were particularly interested in given topics, extractive industries and others, um, that could really help facilitate some of these issues. This was, interestingly, part of what we attempted to do in DRC because so much of the extraction of minerals mm -hmm. in that country um, becomes really uh, conflict minerals as they, as they become known. So there's a variety of different ways in which one can engage, and that's what I was referring to when I said there's so many non-state actors mm -hmm. that are so influential, that have resources, that are operating globally, and that very much want to be able um, to, to move forward and help influence um, our own policy. So these were some of the ways that this was done. Having said that, I traveled to, I would say, about 53, 55 countries. Uh, and in each of them, you know, we had a particular entry point that we were trying to move forward. Some very complex, some not, some very pointed. Um, Kenya, for example, in the last election, um, because Kenya had had so much uh, violence in the previous election, ethnic violence, preventing that kind of violence became a real priority because of where Kenya is, of where it's located, the impact that it can have, Somalia, a whole variety of different reasons. And so that in itself became, um, it just kicked that issue way to the top. And then many resources from both um, the State Department and AID moved forward to help prevent any kind of ethnic violence that would arise. And I think we were somewhat successful in that, if not successful, because none of us read about violence, except mm -hmm. much smaller, in Kenya after the election. Mm -hmm. So these were some of the ways in which you responded to situations. Syria, we have over 100,000 yeah. people who've been killed, two million refugees, six million, I think, internally displaced people. Uh, your former colleague, former Under Secretary of State Tara Sonnenschein, wrote a piece yesterday in which she argued that we really need to focus on humanitarian intervention and, you know, with all the other things that are going on with respect to Syria, we've got to get uh, assistance in there now uh, to help the population in Syria. How, how how would we go about doing that, and what are the prospects for alleviating some of the suffering that's taking place? Well, for starters, we are doing an enormous amount mm -hmm. in that already. But, you know, in Syria, just, just to say a couple of words, I, I worked on Syria from the very beginning. When the Friends of Syria were formed, which was about 70 countries that met right when the crisis started, um, and where, where we were trying to help the opposition to Assad um, become more coherent and be able to develop a unified voice with unified leadership. Um, that has never happened, as you well know. Um, and that, from my perspective, is the major reason that we were really unable to help Syria move to uh, a point in which it could, uh, um, you could resolve the issues without the kind of bloodshed. Um, and, uh, and tragedy that you have now. And to date, there is really still no, no Syrian opposition mm -hmm. that you can name, and there is no mechanism where internally the country can, uh, can address the issue. So that, and I don't see that changing. In fact, as we see more extreme groups coming into that open space, uh, it's more and more difficult to think that we're going to be able to resolve it. The, um, displacement of Syrians began very, very quickly. And, and it started um, in, in um, Turkey. And um, the Turks wanted very much to be able to control the, um, the flow of refugees, but also to build the camps themselves and to manage them themselves. Um, and so that is one of the ways that that's happening. And it has its downsides because the way that we work and humanitarian aid, and, which we're doing in uh, Syria, is by providing most of the resources that we have. And we provide about 25% of the budget 
of humanitarian agencies around the world. Mm -hmm. So we are probably, not probably, we are the most generous in this area, mostly through the UN High Commission on Refugees, uh, the Red Cross, and a couple of other ones. Um, and so that's how we are doing it in, uh, in Syria. And we are, there are refugee camps um, on the border with Jordan, with Lebanon, and uh, with Turkey. And people are now, I visited one of those camps in Jordan where there were two tents there when I was there. I mean, just a huge open space where they were going to put up 5,000 tents to begin with because they saw that the crisis was continuing. And um, today, the, there's probably 200,000 there. Now, um, the, the conditions in those camps, even if you try to do as much as you can to make them, to give them some quality of life, um, it's still you know 120 degrees during the day when the sun is shining, and inside your tent, you can't do anything about mm -hmm. that. So um, the um, and and because the problem is increasing, we can see that those camps are going to continue growing. Now, the um, the United Nations Ref um, High Commission of Refugees does appeals whenever they need specific uh, added resources for specific uh, uh, refugee situations like uh, Syria, and. Tara is completely right. I think we need to step up the amount of resources that we have because we have a whole, really a whole generation now living mm -hmm. in these camps mm -hmm. that are not schooled, that are really, uh, really lost. It's not the first time. Somalia was the same. Um, the refugee camp between Somalia and uh, Kenya called Dadaab um, has over four, had, I mean, things are decreasing, over 400,000 people in it. Uh, and it made it the second largest city in Kenya. So, and when you spoke to people there, some of them had lived there for 12 years, 15 years. So we're beginning, we're seeing the same thing in, uh, in Syria, and we do need to put resources forth um, to just address the, not only that situation, but also the way that it will impact other 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 countries around it. I want to be able to move uh, to you guys to um, get questions from you, but I I, I did want to um, ask you one more, which is when you look back at the time uh, in the State Department, uh, what do you what do you feel were your uh, was or were uh, greatest accomplishments, and what are the things that you'd wished you'd had more time to address and that you hope will still get addressed? Which, you know, one of the difficult things about diplomacy is that there's never a beginning, middle, and end. You know, it's, it's just ongoing, and it's, so it's difficult to point to one specific uh, accomplishment. Um, and in my case, um, I can remember pointed situations where my input um, change the situation to improve the lives of people in, in a significant way. Um, for example, uh, women who were uh, domestic servants in, um, in Jordan from Indonesia who could not go back to their countries but who were being abused in the homes that they were in. Uh, my efforts helped really free them. And so those kind of particular examples are the ones that remain with you. But more, obviously, more importantly, um, I think one of the things that we were able to do was incorporate into diplomacy issues and topics that had never really mm -hmm. uh, been discussed, you know, when two diplomats talk to each other. Um, and uh, I would say issues related to trafficking in persons, uh, to the needs to address uh, the needs of women, uh, and some of these other topics that I've mentioned um, were enormously important. We brought human rights to the table um, and as much as we possibly could, uh, we pushed on those in a way that uh, would, um, would show that our, our policy was right, rights-based to the, to the extent that you possibly could. Of course, you, we know that in Egypt and Russia and other places, you know, we, we have not been very successful. Um, 
But bringing those issues in and making them part of our policy was, I think, very important. One area that I worked in a lot was in the issue of water. Mm-hmm. And the, um, water, not just as a problem of access to water. There's billions of people that don't have access to water and to sanitation. But it's also a security issue um, because co- it is going to be a scarcity of water continues and increases. It is going to become the one flashpoint where countries or regions or uh, people are going to, uh, to enter into conflict. And um, again, we took that issue to a whole nother level. Mm-hmm. We involved our own intelligence agencies in addressing topics of these sorts rather than just military issues to be able to understand better some of the, the, the global dimensions and the roles that, that we can play. I could go on. I mean, I, you know, it was just such an incredible experience. And of course, uh, I couldn't have done it if uh, Joe hadn't uh, been able. Joe, your, your, your distinguished uh, chaplain is my distinguished spouse. <laughs> um, but he, he certainly put up with you know, these working days and with uh, uh, my coming home with briefing books like this and not, you know, not being able to come to enough basketball games here. <laughs> <laughs> what about one thing that you wished you'd had more time to address that you hope will get addressed? Uh, I wish I'd, I wish this reorganization of, uh, of the department had happened earlier when I was there, uh, and I could have consolidated it more, brought more coherence to the way it was working, um, incorporated it more into uh, the way in which the department was operating. Mm-hmm. Um, and engaged it more closely with uh, the work that we do in development. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, I hope, can continue. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a, a very good new undersecretary, Sarah Sewell, uh, with whom I've met and I've talked. And, and the, the logic of being able to work this way uh, in order to carry out our own global leadership um, is one that certainly Secretary Kerry is retaining. But I, I hope that 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 logic and that uh, uh, rationale is clearly seen beyond him. Great. Well, let, I, let's open it up. And uh, if you can say who you are, and uh, if you have a brief question, and if you can wait for the microphone. We have the mic back there. So we'll take back here and then Dan. I'm Michael McClatchy from National Defense University. Ma'am, it's good to see you again. When How the are G- you? When the G family was being born under your leadership and you asked um, Ambassador Dobbins and uh, Professor Adams and me to come and discuss yes. the creation of the new family of bureaus, uh, one of the issues that we discussed was the fate of what at that time was called SCRS, the Office of the Coordinator for Reconstruction of Stabilization and I, I can't remember the exact name. Uh, the president has subsequently made pretty clear that we are not going to be tooled up for major expeditionary uh, activities overseas. At that time, we were in the process of building a, a civilian response corps, a civilian reserve. That's all been dismissed. Wouldn't it make sense now to uncreate that bureau and put the people that are assigned to that bureau back in some of the regional bureaus, all of which are one or two people deep and badly need human resources? Thank you, ma'am. Why don't we take one other question yeah. and then I'll yeah, answer we'll that. Go up here. Okay. Hi, thanks. I'm, I'm Dan Whitman, proud to be on the staff here. Uh, a question about uh, future skill sets for future practitioners in the, in the field. Um, I think every conflict that you've mentioned is uh, intra-state rather than right. interstate. Uh, we know that that's having a profound effect on how defense does its planning. The, the Hegel budget has been much under discussion reductions overall, but increases in uh, the ability to deal with uh, a new type of conflict. Um, Would you have any comments for the sake of uh, students at this, um, at this, at the institute, at at, at SIS? Um, What are the skill sets that will be needed because of the nature, the changes in the nature of conflict, which tend to be more internal than external? That's a good point. Um, and actually, both questions, the questions are very well related <laughs> because uh, 
um, one of the reasons why uh, the Bureau of Conflict Stabilization was developed, this bureau used to be an office. Uh, in the context of the State Department, huge difference. Um, a, an office is just a little place. A bureau, uh, and turning into a bureau means that this uh, topic is developing um, considerable priority. Um, the work of that, um, of that bureau originally was meant to send people, send civilians into the field to be able to help um, address questions of conflict prevention, uh, questions of helping countries stabilize after some kind of crisis. Um, the resources available for that fell off the table. It's really simply what happened. This bureau today is doing things in a different way. And it's it is coordinating far more with AID and the work that it does. Um, it is um, looking more to helping countries assess their own um, vulnerabilities to conflict. So it sends teams that, it do that does that work. Uh, it sends teams um, in, in m much smaller numbers to different to different countries, not only not to solve the issues, but to train local people and to work with local people in a way that really leverages uh, the resources that we have. Um, because there are so many conflicts and because we are, uh, we know that this is going to continue um, in the future, um, eliminating this part of the department would then lessen um, the, the structural ability of the department to, to be able to focus on, on these topics. Um, and so, um, interestingly, the leadership in that uh, bureau uh, has paid enormous amount of attention to coordinating with other agencies in the U.S. government that are also one way or another involved in this. Um, and we're advancing with that. The, the biggest shortcoming is the shortness of resources, which is, uh, you know, which is one of the problems that, uh, um, that I think is going to prevail as we see this. And as uh, we begin to, uh, to, to see this, uh, this issue that, that you are raising, um, because when we're thinking about uh, the kind of skills that one can develop, um, certainly not that long ago, um, there weren't really disciplines when you worked in international uh, affairs or in international development that had to do with peace issues, with conflict uh, resolution, with uh, topics of reconstruction and stabilization, with, tropi with topics of preparedness. Um, and so part, I think, of what we've seen has happened to the curriculum in a school like this is that it has really evolved to address some of the issues that, as we see in the future, um, are going to be enormously important. Um, one area that I think is um, really key to, um, to understand, because I think it's going to play an even uh, more important role, is technology. Um, not just social media and so on, but really the concept of cybersecurity overall, and how that um, can influence um, the way in which uh, uh, the way in which um, events unfold. Um, while I was at the Department of State, we had WikiLeaks also, and after I left the Department of State, we had the Snowden issue, which maybe Joe can tell us what went on because you just did an event on the, on whether Snowden was a traitor or a hero, yeah. a patriot, and uh, which is you know. Really, I mean, these are really important issues mm -hmm. that are going to play into the way in which we, we think about our diplomacy in the future. And, um, and I think one of the things that's also very interesting is that many of these are playing themselves out also in development. I mean, development, of course, it's about health and about um, economic empowerment that I worked in all my life. Uh, but it's also about human rights. It's also about creating that whole structure that can allow a country 
to enable its people to improve the quality of their lives. And so um, courses that have to do with, um, um, with international rule of law, with human rights, with uh, the topics that are so much part and parcel, not just of our beliefs, but they're incorporated into the Universal Declaration of uh, Human Rights. And so th those areas are, I think, um, enormously important. And I did not appreciate those, I have to say, um, to the extent that I do now, because my focus had always been more economic development and more um, um, even balance sheets and you know looking at issues related to uh, um, making um, capital available to poor people. But all of these other topics are the ones that are going to be enormously essential if we're going to help countries develop good governance. And uh, without that, then it becomes more complex. We did on this regard. We had a we had a Dean's discussion in the fall with Assistant Secretary Rick Barton. T did and, you? Good. Good. He's his, the one who's in charge. And, and uh, working for Rick as a senior advisor is Professor Chuck Call. I was just SIS, gonna, I was going to mention that. Yeah. Who is coming back that. in the fall? He assures me. Uh, he was in back, uh, be, he was in Honduras. He played an yeah. important role there. Yeah, we're really excited not only with what he's doing at yeah. State, but also his ability to bring that, to back, bring that back to yeah. the faculty and yeah. students here. Yeah. at SIS. We're looking forward to having them back. I believe we have some questions on uh, Twitter. Is that? Thanks. Uh, Anya Schmemann. Um, and we have a question on Twitter. People are following with hashtag Dean's discussion. So the question is, what is the best way to support female entrepreneurs in developing countries, and why is that important? Well, the argument for um, for the economic empowerment of women, it's been central to the way in which uh, Secretary Clinton addressed uh, the importance of women. Um, and she, she basically said, you know, if a country leaves half of its population behind, it's just simply not going to progress. It's not going to move forward. Um, and so the possibility of enabling women to gain the skills and then to be able to run their own businesses is you know, absolutely key. And the best way to do that is really that combination of making capital available. I mean, microfinance does this. Um, and enabling women to be able to have uh, also access to training uh, and support in being able to start their own little businesses. Because the way that women run businesses is really more as an extension of what they do at home. Women generally know how to cook and how to sew. That's that, that's the extent of uh, many of them uh, are lacking formal education. And so what they do is they extend what they do at home for their domestic responsibilities into cooking in a big frying pan in the street and selling empanadas or selling samosas or selling whatever people eat. Or they have a, they're able to then uh, sew things and then sell them as well. So being able to both help women develop more skills um, beyond those two becomes one of the really important ways in which, uh, uh, in which you can address uh, women. And you're talking primarily about women who are below the poverty line. Mm -hmm. um, that's where, where poverty, uh, women predominate among the poor. Um, and so even though you can also talk about, um, you know, women that want to become entrepreneurs and develop a fashion store or other things. It's really working with women that are very vulnerable, that have um, oftentimes are heads of households that becomes important. And m m what we have demonstrated is that that's better done by private, nonprofit, or private sector organizations rather than banks. I mean, rather than governments. Governments don't do so well in being able to just provide loans or provide that kind of training. So again, this is another way in which partnerships can be formed with existing nonprofit organizations or others that are, uh, are doing this work, like the, the banks that we used to create. We, have, we host here the U.S.-Pakistan Women's Council, which was do you? That's generated. Right. We had a, a big event. Um, on the margins of UNGA back in uh, September of, of 2012, where Secretary Clinton uh, announced the launch of uh, 
the, uh, the US Pakistan Women's Council, right. and so, uh, which is uh, designed to support uh, women entrepreneurs in Pakistan. And so we have a, a, someone is on detail from the State Department here uh, at SIS. Uh, in order to They're help uh, generate yeah. this work uh, in that particular case. We've had a number of students who've been engaged uh, in the work That's of the good, council, good. so yeah. we've been very pleased about that. Yes? Hi, Fanta. Uh, there, wait for the mic, will you? A follow-up question to the question about um, the woman entrepreneur. Given, at least from my perspective, and you can correct me on this, from my perspective, this was probably also <coughs> one of the first times that at least I saw a critical mass of women in more of a power, in, in a more leadership role within the State Department. And so my question is, based on that element, what would you say from a public diplomacy standpoint was perhaps the gender orientation that was perhaps different as a result of that? Um, it was really pretty interesting because Secretary Clinton, um, when you look at the undersecretaries, there's six undersecretaries in the department. And four of us were women. And we would, uh, when we had our meetings with the secretary, we would sit, you know, very close to her. And there were these bright pink jackets and bright green jackets and everybody in power colors. And, uh, and then these gray suits, you know, that the guys were wearing. <laughs> so the point was made loud and clear. But, um, I, you know, it's, um, it is very interesting that our diplomacy traditionally has been two guys, white guys, in uh, you know gray suits and ties talking to each other. Um, and that has been, if we think traditionally, and if you look at the photographs of uh, what happened in the past at the Department of State, this is what uh, prevailed. So um, the incorporation of women uh, into our foreign service uh, and into leadership positions in the Foreign Service um, is beginning to happen. There's still, it's still very difficult to do. And you have to have some intentionality in doing it. I sat in the group that um, selected the, our ambassadors to other countries, our chiefs of mission. Um, and um, when you requested nominations from those the nominated candidates, um, you made it very clear that you needed not only diversity, you know, but gender diversity as well. And unless you do that, it's really very difficult to ensure that women then rise to uh, higher level positions. Um, one of the, I think one of the impacts that Secretary Clinton had was actually change the, the focus of uh, that diplomats had on this issue, which was, oh, women's issues, they are out there. Let women take care of them. But when she made the, the equity, the social, the economic arguments, and then the peace and security arguments, um, it became very clear that you couldn't really leave that out when you were carrying out your policy. And you had to be able, within your own department, to create mechanisms to be able to have uh, women play important roles. It's very interesting that under Kerry, um, there are even more women in uh, positions of, uh, of leadership. Uh, if, if you look at the regional bureaus, um, you have uh, you know, more women certainly than when I was there as well. So, but, but this is something that really needs to be done in a way that, uh, that um, that you pay attention to it because it's still uh, not going to happen um, very, you know, on its own. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah. And then we'll go up front. Why don't we put? I tell you what. I have, there, there are three folks who have their hands up. I'm going to take the three questions and then we'll let you respond. All okay? right. So we'll start with Phil and then we'll go. Up You're going to the have front to help me remember. I will. That's two okay. might be the All most right. I can remember. <laughs> Philip Brenner, I'm a professor here in SIS. Thank you very much for coming. And we hope that you'll find a more permanent way of being in SIS in the future. <laughs> um, and uh, my question is about empathy. About? Empathy. Uh, you are a, a person who had a lot of experience in the third world. Um, and you came to the department with an ability to empathize with uh, people in other countries. 
Uh, did you find that when you brought that perspective to people in the State Department, uh, speaking to the needs of other people and seeing their perspectives, that uh, you were challenged in a way that said, well, the United States has to come first. There's sort of a realist paradigm that says empathy has no place in what we're doing. Or was there a receptivity to the idea of empathy? Very All interesting right, empathy. question. All right, hold on. Empathy. All right. All right. Empathy. Empathy's the first. Then we got the second. Um, also, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Rebecca Bach. I'm an undergraduate here. I recently started... What year are you? A junior. Uh -huh. Great. I came back from abroad, and a lot of the sentiments from the foreign students that I was with was that the U.S. power is kind of on the decline. So I was wondering if you could speak to that and if there's, like, any issue with, like, new trust issues um, with the U.S. government kind of and our power role in the future. Great. Good. All right, and then Bob. Thanks. The real question, I want to ask Maria, but uh, <clears throat> it, you've come to our classes so often as a guest. Now that you're not part of the government, are you available again? <laughs> but let me ask a different question for the purposes of this. Uh, maybe building on a little bit as the uh, U.S. foreign power seems to be dropping uh, many observers talk about the business world rising and companies uh, getting more involved in not only f you know, economic development but even some foreign policy, human rights issues. I'm curious from your time in state, did you do very much work with businesses and what potential or what uh, wariness do you see in this as a trend? Wow, that's great. You know, great questions. Empathy. Um, it's it's a very it's a very interesting question because as everywhere else the Department of State is not made up of um, same of people who all look and think and feel the same way you know you find entry points that allow you to carry out the work that I was doing um, that I had to find um, I also and this is why I think it was so wonderful to work under. Secretary Clinton is that she really gave you coverage. You know, one time, um, so, well, I'll tell I, I won't do the one time, but um, what was unusual was that as undersecretary, I was interested in working to help address these issues in our policy and these issues of vulnerable populations, basically, if you use that term broadly. and. Um, the, that usually, and a lot of the places where that had to be done were not in garden spots. And so a lot of my travel was to really difficult places um, and to places where undersecretaries didn't usually go. And so when I wanted to do work in the hard countries in um, Africa, for example, in Nigeria, I mean, Lagos? You want to go to Lagos? I mean, it's just so, so difficult to travel and, and work in those places. Um, but when I said, yes, I'll go there because we really do need to have a high-level person from the department uh, make these points to the president of Nigeria, the regional, uh, the assistant secretary for Africa was delighted that I would use that high title to go to a country that seldom got any attention from, um, from an undersecretary. When I went to Belize to talk about issues of LGBT, where it's a country that doesn't get a lot of focus, um, it was the first time an undersecretary had gone to Belize. So, the, so I had no trouble finding people and finding opportunities in the department that allowed me to play this out. Um, because you were bringing empathy to uh, an, uh, an agency that is very hierarchical, that's very structured, and you were bringing it at a, at a very high level. And you were, for that reason, able to do things that, um, that under normal circumstances uh, were difficult to do. So interestingly, I think it, uh, I did not really suffer any kind of frustration from that perspective. Um, 
the one place where it was hard to do was making sure that my topics were incorporated into the talking points um, that we had with really with foreign ministers, with presidents, when I was not delivering them. And uh, so there you would see uh, a little more reluctance to be able to you know, include trafficking in persons, for example, is one of the topics that you're going to talk to uh, you know, the, the president uh, of, uh, of a country that you're trying to develop a good relationship with when what they're doing in trafficking in persons is horrible. So that's, that's one way that I would, uh, that I would answer, um, answer that issue. Um, the topic that you brought up about the, the declining role of the U.S., it's, it actually is, um, again, important to look at um, the way in which um, the world is reshaping in the 21st century, where you really no longer you know, have the U.S. as being um, um, the, one, you know, the one country with the, the absolutely the biggest economy, the biggest power, and the biggest uh, uh, ability to really um, wield a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, presence and force. You see a growing number of countries and, um, whose economies are growing who are actually benefiting from the fact that um, in some cases they've developed their own democratic systems, they've been able to build the middle class, and they themselves are um, becoming and wanting to become important players in, um, um, in the world. The North-South uh, division of countries no longer really in indicates the East-West doesn't really uh, work either. So um, par part of the, the dilemma today, not the dilemma, but the challenge is that U.S. is still in a position to really provide global leadership in many issues for many of the reasons that make this country great um, and that many people uh, respect. Uh, but it has to do it in a completely different way that incorporates other countries and enables other countries to work hand in hand with them. And that's really what um, Obama has been trying to do from, uh, from the very beginning. Um, the issues that uh, concern us um, concern other countries because we're so interconnected now. And so you can't really just lead on your own or make decisions on your own. I mean, certainly, uh, I mean, if Ukraine is not an example of that, you know, it's, uh, it's really pretty important. So, uh, so I, would, I, I don't know that one, I would say that there is a decline. Uh, certainly if you listen to the Republicans in this country, this is what you would hear. But I have to tell you that in the countries that I visited and in um, the interactions that I had, there's so much respect for this country. There's so much respect for this administration that is promoting and uh, engaging um, itself in a way that uh, uh, makes use of uh, the, the principles and the values that, uh, that are so important to the way in which this democracy was created. So, um, but it's very, it's very difficult and very tricky. And then finally on um, businesses, businesses are very involved in uh, trying to shape the agenda of the world, not just uh, to make money, but because they see that some of the, the trends, uh, the threats uh, that we face, that cross borders will completely affect their ability to operate. So they have become very engaged in everything from climate change to water security to, um, I was talking about conflict minerals earlier, and, um, and they have become very engaged in human rights, not very, I, and I say they, this is some of them, um, in issues related to human rights. Because there is an intersection there where in order to do good business, you really want to also be able to promote um, uh, the rights of people in that country. Um, and um, it is very interesting that the person that worked at the Department of State, Mike Posner, um, and ran the Democracy and Human Rights Bureau, uh, who worked as part of my piece. Mike 
Posner is one of the most respected human rights um, people. He headed up Human Rights First for many years. Is now he left the Department of State and he's now at um, New York University and he started a new center called the Center of Business and Human Rights. Mm. So again, that intersection and that would also go back a little bit to the issue that you that you asked. You know, is um, understanding uh, the global economy, global finance, and how businesses play out their work. It's also in a whole other area that is very important because you can't disassociate these two things as multinational you know, companies did forever. I mean, they, they were exploitative and they ignored um, the rights of, uh, uh, of people. And now we're beginning to see more and more that the consumer um, is calling on companies to, uh, to, be, um, to be more environmentally friendly, to be more respectful, to do away with sweatshops. And to the extent that consumers continue to do that, the more those attributes are going to actually improve the bottom line. Great. Well, Maria, thank you so much thank for you. joining us today. Thank you. Thanks. I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank, thank those so who watched much. on the live stream. And uh, thanks the, the staff here for setting this up. Uh, it was wonderful to have you on campus. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. I appreciate your coming. Thank you. <laughs> Make her an offer. <laughs> Did you hear that? How are you? Good to see you. Thank you. Was it good? Yeah, that's great. Good, Thank you. good, good. Always great. To Thank have you. you. Oh, look at this. What is this? This is your interview with Prism. Oh my goodness! I don't have it. I don't have a copy of this.